After all these many preliminaries, this discourse has now arrived at the explanation of the Buddha about meditation. So again, you can see from that that meditation has to be embedded in a whole spiritual endeavor. It isn't something that one can do by just plunking oneself down on a pillow and hoping for the best. There is the necessity of those preliminary steps. Also, I like to say again, we don't expect to be perfect in any of these preliminary steps before we can start meditation, but what we hope to do is practice all of them. The last, very last sentence on the abandoning of the hindrances, I'm going to read that out again because that's the immediately before the Buddha starts explaining the meditative absorption. When one sees that the five hindrances have been abandoned, gladness arises. Now, obviously, these five hindrances are abandoned when one sits down and one sees that at that time they are not in one's mind. So then one has gladness. When one is glad, then rapture arises. When the mind is filled with rapture, the body becomes tranquil. Tranquil in body, there's happiness. And being happy, the mind becomes concentrated. So we are again enjoined to have the knowledge at the time of the meditation that we are free from obstruction. In other words, we look in our mind, see that we're free from obstruction. And then when mind and body are at ease, happy and tranquil, we can become concentrated. That's why the Buddha said, mind and body have to be comfortable. And comfortable is a word that can be misunderstood, so this is better, that there's gladness, and of that gladness then there's happiness and there's concentration. So the next thing that comes now are the jhanas, and the word jhana is shorter and easier than meditative absorption, so I'll stick to that. It's J-H-A-N-A. Quite secluded from sense pleasures, secluded from unwholesome states, one enters and dwells in the first jhana, which is accompanied by applied and sustained application and filled with rapture and happiness born of seclusion. One drenches, steeps, saturates and suffuses the body with this rapture and happiness born of seclusion so that there is no part of the entire body which is not suffused by rapture and happiness. I'll explain it in a moment, but I'll read you the simile that the Buddha has given for that state that he says it suffuses the entire body. Great King, Suppose a skilled bath attendant or his apprentice were to pour soap powder into a metal basin, sprinkle it with water and knead it into a ball so that the ball of soap powder would be pervaded by moisture, encompassed by moisture, suffused with moisture, inside and out, yet it would not trickle. So apparently this is how soap used to be made. So that is being used as a simile, as a description. In the same way, a person, a meditator, drenches, steeps, saturates and suffuses the body with the rapture and happiness born of seclusion so that there is no part of the entire body which is not suffused by rapture and happiness. This great king is a visible fruit of the spiritual life, more excellent and sublime than the previous ones. First of all, I think
the first thing I wanted to say about what I've just read is that there's very little doubt, I think, necessary, in fact none, whether the Buddha taught the jhanas or not. And that he said that they were a visible fruit of the spiritual path, more excellent and sublime than the previous ones. So there should be little doubt left in anybody's mind whether the Buddha thought that one should practice them. Never mind whether he taught them that one should practice them. All one has to do is read his discourses. Maybe I should add to this that every discourse that speaks about meditation and there are many, many speak about the jhanas. Even in the Satipatthana Sutta, the discourse on the foundations of mindfulness, there is one part about the breath which will also give rise to the jhanas. They are not mentioned by name, and that's about the only discourse which speaks about meditation which does not have the jhanas in it. Every other discourse does. So one um, need not wonder or be um, doubtful about it. It is the path that the Buddha himself took and that he taught. Quite secluded from sense pleasures. This is how every description of the jhana starts. There's no way we can get into an absorption if we have ideas that we'd like to have lunch or that we'd like to have more comfort, or that we'd like to have it colder or warmer or pleasanter, or whatever it is that we would like, we have to be secluded from sense pleasures. And the word seclu secluded comes again, born of seclusion. And very often people think that that means that one has to live in a cave, in fact, this is being said, I've heard it said, that people can only do the jhanas if they've lived in the forest for at least 20 years. I have heard that said myself, not just secondhand, but firsthand. And it is being said like that. This is why the reason for that is because it says born of seclusion. But all it means is secluded from one's sense pleasures, and, of course, secluded from the five hindrances. That's all it means. A person who is able to do the jhanas can do them anywhere. And I think I told you already the story where the Buddha was sitting by the edge of a river and when he came out of meditation he realized that the 500 ox carts had gone through that river, which is far worse than what the singing is here on Friday night. <laughs> so if anybody can do the jhanas they eventually will be able to do it like that um, we may not be able to do it with 500 ox carts primarily because there wouldn't, we wouldn't find any 500 <laughs> ox carts but it's the seclusion from the sense pleasures and the seclusion from the five hindrances that's all it means and uh, this place is fine, at home is fine, anywhere is fine. In fact, when one is really um, skilled at it, that means one has practiced for years on end, the first jhanas can be done in any worldly situation at all. So it has nothing to do with living in the forest. The um, Buddha did, uh, as you remember maybe, he did advocate for the meditation to go to a secluded dwelling, to the forest, to the foot of a tree. But it doesn't necessarily mean that in order to meditate that we have to live there. Once we are capable of doing our meditation, we can do it very nicely at home. Secluded from unwholesome states, that's the five hindrances. The five hindrances are unwholesome states any one of them. To enter and dwell in the first jhana, accompanied by applied and sustained application filled with rapture and happiness born of seclusion. The first jhana has, according to 
the experience of the Buddha and all other people, five factors. And these five factors are mentioned here. The first two are initial and applied application. Unfortunately, they are often translated wrongly. And here too, it says applied and sustained thought. And that's not what it's all about. The reason for the wrong translations is the fact that the meditators haven't got time to translate and the translators haven't got time to meditate. So we wind up with an approximate translation when it comes to the meditative path. And then we just change a few words and we've got it all right. So what it is is we can say applied and sustained, we can use those words, but we can't use the word thought because that sounds as if we're trying to think about something. It means nothing else other than applying one's mind to the meditation subject. And if we're thinking by, during that time, we all know what happens. Nothing. The jhanas are not going to happen. It's just thinking will happen. So what we do is we apply the mind to the meditation subject and then we can sustain that application. Now these are the first two factors in Pali, Vitaka, Vichara and they are usually mentioned together because even if one is not skilled in meditation yet one, if one applies one's mind to the meditation subject one will stay on it for a little while at least. Now, these first two are what we do when, when we practice, when we use the breath. Now, I'd like to explain that also. And those of you who have been in the seven-day course just before this will just have to practice a little patience and compassion because you've heard it already, but some people here haven't. The meditation subject, whether it's the breath, whether it's the uh, the stomach, at the nostrils, whether it's with a picture or with a counting, whether it's just a sensation, or whether it's the um, sweeping, any meditation subject, any method, is like a key. It's not the meditation. And that key has to be put into the keyhole by hanging on to the key long enough and steady enough in order to hit the keyhole. If we're wavering about, we won't make it into the keyhole. And having stuck that into the keyhole, we unlock the door. And if we keep on meditating, we won't have to unlock the door all the time. We'll keep it open. We don't need the method any longer. We have an open door and we can enter into a mansion which has eight chambers. And these eight chambers are the eight jhanas. And it may be of interest to mention that I've taken the simile of the mansion with eight chambers from Teresa de Villa, one of the great Catholic mystics of the Middle Ages who did exactly the same thing and used that simile. So this is not something that is um, special or that has any kind of connotation of any particular religion. This is the way the human mind goes when it is allowed to concentrate, when it is allowed to focus on what it really contains within, and everybody goes along the same path. If that wasn't so, it would be impossible to teach meditation. Now, the methods that we use are different ones. And some people have more success with one method and others with another method. But to think of the method as something 
that one has to hang on to is of course also uh, a mistaken view because it's nothing but the key the important thing is to get inside the house the trigger which happens in order to be able to unlock the door is individually different and those of you who have been told by me this will remember that I said now recapitulate how to get in there so that you have your pathway and also those triggers eventually one doesn't need anymore but in the beginning there is a certain trigger and this certain trigger is individually different but the path is always the same and that's why it's possible to teach meditation and that's why it's possible to know whether it has actually happened or whether it's out of a book which also happens so the minds of people who follow a different religion is the same as ours there's no difference Meister Eckhart probably the greatest of the Christian mystics of the Middle Ages went along the same path very difficult to find in his writing because he used a different kind of terminology but in Teresa de Avila if you're interested it's called the interior castle you will find it exactly described only in Christian terminology which is far more colorful in her case and imaginary than ours Buddha's terminology is extremely practical and down to earth and therefore much easier to follow now having been able to stay on the meditation subject long enough one can open this door the first two factors of meditation initial and sustained application and I will use those words because I'm used to them as a trans, uh, translation have immediate results they are automatic antidotes for two of our hindrances the initial application to the meditation is an antidote to dullness and drowsiness in the mind or to sloth and torpor or to laziness and drowsiness whichever you like when one sits down with the intention to meditate one counteracts the dullness the drowsiness the procrastination the lack of interest the mind which can't be bothered one sits down and does it and the more often one does it the more one cuts down that weed of the third hindrance of dullness and drowsiness now obviously we still have to keep remembering that this comes up and do something about it in our daily lives which the antidotes we have already discussed yesterday but this is automatic sitting down and doing it whether it's successful or not does not even enter into the picture here the only thing is to sit down with the intention so we have already immediate benefit and the sustained application is the one that counteracts skeptical doubt mm -hmm. so if one can actually stay on the meditation subject one has personal proof that it's possible and one has personal proof that the Buddha's explanation is correct it is possible to stay let's say on the breath and at that time even just staying on the breath some gladness some peacefulness arises already so the doubt has an automatic antidote now the doubt Buddha compared as you remember from yesterday's um, description as being in the desert and not going knowing which way to go but here we have already a pathway we're able to stay with it now the very excellent result of that is also self-confidence confidence that one is actually able 
to have a result on the spiritual path. Because in most people's minds, until they get teaching, the spiritual path is just a word. You don't even know what it's all about. And the doubt whether one can do it and the doubt whether it is actually worthwhile and the doubt whether it is the correct one is in everybody's mind until there is a definite thing to experience. So this counteracts that. Obviously also when we use the substitution from the unwholesome to the wholesome and that works we also counteract doubt but that's outside of meditation this is counteracting doubt in meditation and since everybody is looking for calm and tranquility this will be the first one that happens this is a pathway of calm and tranquility but embedded in every step on the way is insight. Now I've also given you insight methods to use because they're also taught by the Buddha and we should not neglect them. But interestingly enough, the calm and tranquility path brings with it almost automatic insights. They do need to be reinforced for most people, not for everyone. Some people, it's sufficient to go along the calm, tranquility path and the insights are sufficient to take the step out. They have to be reinforced, the insights. And we will have, after I have explained all eight jhanas, we will have then the opportunity to have more explanation of the insight path. Again, there are only two directions of meditation. There is nothing else. It's calm and insight, samatha and vipassana. And neither one of these words describe a method. Samatha is a result and vipassana is a result. Calm and insight, these are the results. The methods are multitudinous, innumerable. For the calm path, there are, we're using the breath, there are others that we could use. And for the inside path, those that I have already mentioned to you, to dissect body and mind and to go towards anicca dukkha anatta with one's investigative um, ability. But we must also remember that while insights can arise at any time, the mind which is able to have the peacefulness and the change of consciousness that we get with the jhanas has a totally different ability to gain insight. It is unlikely that one can gain the profoundest insight without gaining profound calm. It doesn't appear to be logical. The ordinary, everyday kind of consciousness, which all of us know very well because we have to use it in order to keep ourselves alive, is not designed to see the opposite of what we're all after, namely survival. It's not designed for that. It's designed for survival, the ordinary consciousness. Therefore, the jhana consciousness is a kind of consciousness which can see things in a totally different light, where survival is nothing but craving and 
opposed to Nibbana, not the survival, the craving is opposed to Nibbana. With our everyday consciousness where we go shopping and uh, l uh, clean up our houses and uh, do our office work and telephone our friends and uh, discuss uh, the um, uh, state of the nation, we can't possibly see that craving for survival is a defilement. How could we? So it has to have a totally different consciousness and that comes from the jhanas. It is the only way to get a different consciousness. There is no other. And anything that has ever been written about, advertised, shown as some sort of uh, mysterious happening, anything that has to do with any kind of Consciousness change has to do with the jhanas. There is nothing else. Human minds are all one and the same. They have no, there's nothing different. We have different uh, degrees of defilement, that's about all. The uh, degree of defilement depending on the length of practice. So we have the first two factors which counteract two of our uh, hindrances very effectively. And then comes the third factor, which in Pali is called PT, P-I-T-I, not the English PT, the PT. And that is translated in all manner and form. And again, because the meditators have no time to translate and the translators have no time to meditate, we can never be quite sure what word they're using. Rapture is used very often. Bliss is used. What it boils down to is delightful sensation. That's what it boils down to. Nobody's ever translated like that. It doesn't sound maybe uh, fantastic enough. It can be very strong. It can be medium. It can be very mild. It depends upon the state of mind with which one has settled down to the meditation and the amount of concentration. If the mind is strongly concentrated and has absolutely no extraneous business at all, it will be a very strong sensation. In the, the most famous commentary on the Buddha's teaching is the Visuddhimagga, the path of purification, written in the 5th century by a monk called Buddha Gosa, who lived in Sri Lanka. It's a very fat book about this fat and uh, dry as dust, <laughs> but it has everything in it. And in it is also described the different kinds of PT one can get. The Buddha didn't go into that. He said it's rapturous and that was all he said. One gets, I get the feeling that either we lost some of the explanations of the jhanas, which is quite possible, or that everybody could do them anyway. There was no need to explain anything. So I don't know which. But the explanation of the jhana, the first jhana, is all that you have just heard. That's all there is. That's all the Buddha ever said about the first jhana. Now there are other discourses, dozens of them, that all mention the first jhana, but this, or all of the jhanas, but there's never any more than this, what I've just read out. That's the whole of it. So it's either lost or anybody, everybody did it anyway and there was no need to say much about it. However, I would assume more that it got lost because this he's talking to the king who's probably never had meditated in his life. So it would have been quite useful to tell him more. So I would say that the more um, detailed explanations might have been lost. 
the Misuri Maga goes into the details with a vengeance. Every detail is mentioned. And 17 different kinds of this rapturous sensation are mentioned. I'm quite sure that one can even find more than 17. But some that are mentioned, and a few are mentioned here in the commentary, are tingling, light as opposed to heavy, uh, floating, rising, showering, shaking, I don't know if that's so pleasant. That's all that's mentioned here also. The criteria is not the kind of sensation. It doesn't matter at all. The criteria is that the sensation is delightful and that nobody ever has any doubts whether it is delightful or not. It's impossible. If, it, if there are any doubts, it's not the first John. If it is uh, a little bit this and a little bit that, or maybe so, or maybe another, it's never the first jhana. It's very simple to understand because it is utterly delightful. Now the word PT, translated as rapture, bliss, or delightful sensation, is also translated as interest. Because this is when finally real interest in meditation starts. Now, there are some admirable people around, and I know them myself, who meditate year after year without ever getting there. And that's admirable, because it does take a fair bit of self-discipline. There are those around, and I also know those, who actually get there and still do not meditate daily at home. So the generalization of when you get there, you'll have so much interest, you continue to meditate, was also not always true unfortunately. But it does create a lot of interest. And because the interest is there in this delightful sensation, the mind focuses on it, of course, because it's very interesting. It's, uh, and if it happens the first time, the mind is apt to say, oh, what was that? And of course, then you have to start all over again. Because when the mind says anything, it's stopped its meditation. This sensation has a very important uh, quality. You see, they're not just pleasantnesses. The important quality is that it counteracts ill will, our second hindrance. It counteracts it while we are in it, of course, but it has more, it is more to it than that. The PT has a residual effect. All of the jhana factors have residual effects from then on. There is, they do not, although they, I, I should not say they do not disappear, they do disappear when one isn't in meditation. But they leave a sort of a film behind, which seems to oil the wheels a bit. Because if you become aware of how life goes, it's a bit bumpy, usually. It's always connected with wanting and not wanting. I like it this way, I don't like it that way. Even when everything's going well. I mean, when I'm talking about when things are going fine. But this, even the first jhana, leaves a sort of a oiling behind, but it lead, also it need, uh, something else. Being skilled at doing this, at doing the jhanas, the mind knows quite clearly that it can always return there when it wants to. Any time one sits down in meditation, the mind can go home, because that's the only home the mind will ever have. And knowing that, brings a great deal of peacefulness in daily life. Even if we don't go there at the time because we have to talk to people, telephone, write letters, 
do, to earn a living, whatever it may be that we have to do, we still know we can go there. And so the adversities that everybody confronts in daily living, whether they are small, minor, medium or major, do not have the sting to them that they used to have. They just are. And one notices them. So the ill will does not arise so easily. It hasn't been uprooted by any means. Unfortunately, that takes far more than this. But it doesn't arise this easily. Now, this is one of the great benefits. Because ill will is the most unpleasant sensation, unpleasant emotion, I should say, that we can have. And it makes life difficult for ourselves. In fact, it makes it unbearable at times. And it makes it difficult for the people that we have contact with. Even though they might not um, repay us in kind, but they're certainly aware of the ill will. So having that as um, defense mechanism, the PT, is... uh, such a great boon. Now from a practical standpoint, those of you who can do it know this already. Those of you who maybe are working on it, there are certain points that need to be made. As the mind becomes concentrated, it becomes finer and finer in its whole vibration. The vibration becomes finer. When one is excited, then the vibrations are strong in the mind. When one is calm, the vibrations are very fine and subtle. And with the fine and subtle vibrations of the mind, the breath follows suit. The breath also becomes fine and subtle. They go together. So when the breath has become fine and subtle, It may be hard to find at that moment or it is so as it appears to have disappeared. Now obviously it doesn't because if the breath should disappear we'd be dead. But if we haven't got much skill yet at this the thought can arise that I'm not breathing and take a deep breath at that time which is exactly counterproductive to going into the jhanas. It's exactly the opposite of what one should do. And being forewarned means being forearmed. So knowing that the breath has become fine because the mind has become fine means that at that moment we go inside of ourselves to become aware of this very pleasant sensation, delightful sensation. In some cases, the delightful sensation is so strong that we can't help but become aware of it. In other cases, we are so fixed, fixated, I should say, on the breath that we don't even become aware of the fact that there is a very pleasant sensation. And in other cases, it is quite possible that because we, one has been told over and over again to stay with the breath, that one doesn't pay proper attention to the fact that it's no longer necessary to stay on the breath. Now, obviously, to think of meditation maybe as a lifelong occupation and to stay with the breath lifelong would be a rather tedious outlook. So, at that time, the breath has done its job. It has opened the door for us. And then the sensation is the meditation subject. Now, from a practical standpoint, the mind will then have to stay with that sensation as its meditation subject for a good period of time, which I usually describe as 10 minutes but that doesn't mean that one should look on one's watch and see whether now 10 minutes are up. 
I'm only using that as a description for a solid chunk of time, not just a fleeting acquaintance with that uh, sensation. In the beginning, when one isn't skilled at this yet, the mind will fall off again and again because it hasn't really become so um, one-pointed yet. Now, as it isn't so one-pointed yet and falls off the sensation, which appears to the mind as if the sensation has gone, one just brings it back on it again. The interesting part of it, at least I think it's interesting, is that this sensation is always there. All of these jhana factors, every single one of them, all eight, are always in within us to be found, to be experienced. They, we haven't put them in there just because we've got here and been sitting around on this pillow. We haven't made them appear all of a sudden. They're always there. The only thing is, that our thinking, our negativities, our preoccupations are covering that up so that we can't get in there. We've got it within at all times. It's also a question, of course, of the purification, which has already taken place within us. The more purification that has taken place, the easier it is to get at it. The less purification, the more we still have to work at it. But the sensation and then all the other factors which I will describe and which are mentioned are always there. So it isn't something that we have all of a sudden become endowed with or that is something new has been added. This is part and parcel of being a human being. Unfortunately, very few human beings, when we think of the billions that live on the planet, ever get to know it. And when they do get to know it, in some um, traditions it is taught, particularly in the Hindu tradition, when they do get to know it, in the Hindu tradition it's very often considered to be caused by the guru. And this was one of the reasons why the Buddha was adamant about a non-guru teaching. No gurus in Buddhism. He said, whoever sees me sees the Dhamma. Whoever sees the Dhamma sees me. The only thing that matters is the teaching. Because if we ever have the idea that we need a guru in order to do this, we'll never be free. We'll always be dependent. And the Buddha's teaching was to have complete freedom. The other thing that arises at the same time is happiness. Oh, just have a look what it's translated as. Yeah, happiness. It's not possible to have this very pleasant sensation, very delightful sensation, and not experience happiness. The two, the both of them arise together. And because they arise together, because of that, the ill will that every unenlightened person carries around is totally eliminated during that time. We can't be happy and have ill will. Now this is a very important thing to know about oneself. Because then we can also take that knowledge into daily life. And if somebody has ill will, is angry, is hateful, is unpleasant, we will know immediately that person is unhappy. And we can immediately have compassion. The foolishness of then becoming angry at that angry person is the absurdity that of human beings who do not take time to 
consider what is really happening. And most people can't take the time in daily life because everything happens too fast in daily life. That's why we have to learn it in a situation such as here. Happiness and ill will can never arise together. So the person with ill will is unhappy. And this is um, a matter of continual practice, of course, so that it becomes part of our thought process then we won't find it difficult to have compassion with someone who is angry or negative. The happiness which arises at the same time is, however, overshadowed by the physical sensation. The uh, happiness as an emotion is more subtle than the physical sensation. So the the whole aspect of going from first to eighth jhana has the progression of from the gross to the most subtle. It becomes more and more subtle as we go along. Now the Buddha said about the jhanas, this is a pleasure I will allow myself. And It is very important for another reason, not only because we need that change of consciousness, which is obvious, but it's another reason also. Until we can do the jhanas, all our pleasures come through our senses. There is no other way of getting them. It's seeing, hearing, tasting, touching, smelling and thinking. That's all we get. Now, having been able to get past that, secluded from our sensual desires, secluded from our five hindrances, having been able to get past that and just being concentrated and being in touch with what is inside of us at all times shows us quite clearly that our sensual gratifications are in no measure equal to the happiness which arises from the jhanas. And our intelligent mind will be able to tell us that while there are pleasant sense contacts in the world, to sit down and have the pleasure and the delight of the concentration is far superior. So we have our first step getting away from the search for the sensual pleasure. All human beings search for them, often without result, very often with result, but getting them is different from searching for them. And knowing them for what they are, extremely fleeting, never fulfilling, arises with that ability to have contact with the inner purity which gives rise to that delight. Obviously this is the cause, the inner purity. Even though it is momentary, that inner purity is only available to us during the meditation, it has enormous effects because it is the constant cutting down of the weeds until they become so small and so weak that their root system can be uprooted. When we don't do that, we have a very difficult task ahead of us. One which is not likely 
to succeed, to uproot the defilements without that system of support that we get through the meditation, through the jhanas. Of course, this is called the full concentration and in the commentaries it says that the first step towards that is the neighborhood concentration, excess concentration, which again from a practical standpoint appears to have the attention on the meditation subject while thoughts are going on in the background but do not seem to have any solidity to them. One can't put a name to them. Now, if that is the case, if that is happening, one needs a little more determination to really fall into the meditation subject. The happiness, which arises simultaneously with the delightful feeling, is our antidote, automatic antidote, against the fourth hindrance, restlessness and worry. Because having happiness at that time, even though it's mixed up with a delightful feeling, there still can't be anything else except happiness there too. There's nothing to search for. We don't have to be restless at that time. And there's nothing to worry about. We can't worry and be happy at the same time. So we have this with these factors, automatic antidotes against the hindrances. Now there's one more factor which is always present when the mind is concentrated, and that's one-pointedness. So we have initial and sustained application. We have delightful sensation, PT, rapture, if you like, happiness, and one-pointedness five factors of meditation which counteract five factors of the hindrances automatically. Even if they didn't do anything else, what more could one want? One doesn't even have to try. All one has to do is keep one's mind on the breath long enough to get in there. The uh, Happiness which arises is the automatic um, antidote for restlessness and worry. And anyone who is particularly prone to worry will find this an enormous relief. People who are not so prone to worry, they just take it in their stride. But anyone who is always worrying will find this an enormous uh, difference. And the restlessness is, of course, due to the fact that we haven't got what we want. The one-pointedness counteracts the sensual desire. Because when there is one-pointedness on the meditation subject, sensual desire cannot arise. So these are automatic helpmates without which it would be highly unlikely that this purification process can take, really, can take place in a way which will be significant. Naturally, all meditation has some purification in it because every moment of concentration is a moment of purification. But the significance comes, the real changeover comes when the concentration comes to this point. These five factors of the meditation, if we are repeat them over and over again, of course, help also to put down the hindrances over and over again. And yet, at the beginning of the meditation, it is not necessary to know that I am now free at this point in time, free from the hindrances so that the mind can go into the um, concentration. Now here is uh, something by the commentary based on words of the Buddha that are in a different knot in here. It is said 
the eight meditative attainments, which are the eight jhanas, are indispensable to the achievement of direct knowledges. The um, direct knowledges, the only one that really is of concern to us is the knowledge that leads to Nibbana. And also what is said about the jhana here is that one has to eventually become, get the mastery over them, which means one can do them forward, backward, skipping any one of them that one wants, entering into them at any time that one wishes, making a decision on the length of time that one wants to stay in there, and being able to come out of them and reverting back or adverting back to ordinary consciousness. Now there is something to be said about the latter, which is not uh, unimportant, And that is, having done, and we're only talking about the first jhana right now, having done the first jhana and being able to stay with the sensation, which is at that time the most prominent of the factors with that delightful sensation. When at the end, when either the concentration is, has lapsed or the time of the meditation is over, one needs to be aware of the dissolution of this delightful feeling and recognize it as the impermanence inherent in everything that exists in the universe and not allow the mind to say, oh, what a pity, hope I can get it back. But realizing the impermanence of it. That's one very important factor. Then, if one isn't very skilled at it yet, hasn't done it for very long, comes the recapitulation, how did I get in there? What trigger did I use? In other words, what happened from the moment I entered the meditation hall? How did I think? How did I act? What did I do sitting down? Did I sit differently? Did I eat differently? Did I uh, use loving kindness? What did I do? Every step on the way. So that one has a completely clear pathway. And having got that clear, completely clear pathway, then one uses it, of course, and eventually it has become so well trodden that one doesn't have to look at all the landmarks anymore. One just goes along that path to where one wants to go. Those that are skilled at it go forward and backward, skipping also anyone going from one to another, at, because it is absolutely essential that one knows each one intimately. If one doesn't know each one intimately, one doesn't have the exact benefit from them. and the imp impermanence aspect. Another thing which one can also inquire into, or maybe recognize, I should say, is that it is only possible to be in those states of concentration if the me keeps quiet for a little while, doesn't say anything. It doesn't say, look how nice I can meditate. It doesn't say, look, I can't meditate. It doesn't say it's too late, it's too early, I don't like it, I don't want it, I do want it. Nothing like that. It's not talking for a while. It keeps completely quiet. It is, for that time of the meditation, shut out. It is not um, taken any notice of. Obviously, it comes right back. The minute one is finished with it, but during that time, it doesn't have any function at all. And this is very important also for getting in there, because it is only possible to get to the concentration 
if one surrenders completely. One surrenders oneself to the process. Without any fear, without any holding back, without any resistance, but just surrenders oneself to whatever there is. The breath, it's life, surrendering oneself to that, surrendering oneself to the sensation, whatever it may be, and just being that. And the uh, simile that the Buddha gave here about the uh, skilled bath attendant or his apprentice who makes soap out of soap powder. It's interesting, I guess in those days you couldn't buy soap, you had to make it, make soap powder and get water in it and knead it into a ball. It means that one's whole body is drenched, steeped, saturated with this rapture and happiness born of seclusion so that there's no part of the entire body which is not suffused by this rapture and happiness. So that is the first jhana and tomorrow we'll discuss the second one. Do you have any questions? This is the time to ask them. Yes. I'm sure you've probably answered this many times before, but I've taken a number of other courses and probably heard, even heard the word jhana maybe three or four times. Um, all with prominent, well-respected teachers. So what's what's the story? Why does everybody ignore the jhana? Michael, you're going to these well-respected teachers. Please ask them. I cannot answer for them. I don't know. You're going to see them soon. Please ask them. And write me a letter and tell me. The next time I get the same question, I'll be able to answer. I have no idea. I do know that Mahasi Sayadaw, who's now deceased and was a highly respected uh, um, one of the greatest monks of Burma I think he wrote 77 books on meditation and uh, I think has in one of his books not all of these are uh, translated into English only three I think are translated into English um, in one of his books it is uh, actually laid out quite clearly that this is the wrong path, the jhanas. And, um, which is a misunderstanding, it's a complete misunderstanding. I will, I will come to that when we go through the inside pa uh, steps. The, um, the wrong path is when one believes, as this was done in India and probably is still done today, that one believes that when having done the jhanas, when one has gone the whole way. That's the wrong path. But without them, the path doesn't happen. It can't. Now, in the Buddha's time, there is a mention of some arahants, and the translation of the word is very strange, and often said it's not the right translation, they're called dry vision arahants. It's, um, it is mentioned that this is not the right translation, but not said what is the right translation. Um, it is supposed to mean that these arahants were enlightened, sort of dry, which means without the jhanas. And they are specially mentioned as something special. And also the explanation which is then given why this happened, and this is all in the suttas, because they had lifetimes of practice behind them. And then came, again, reappeared at the time of the Buddha and were able to use that lifetimes of practice that they had behind them to immediately recognize what the Buddha taught and were able to become enlightened that way. 
Now, these are mentioned as great exceptions. The, um, that is a special story about them. So, whether it comes from that, or whether it comes from Mahasi Sayadaw, who has given this uh, ten wrong, uh, wrong word pathway, I really don't know. I really don't know. All I know is that anybody who can do them and teaches would be um, deficient in his um, obligation if he weren't to teach them. Because this is what everybody wants. And this is what brings happiness and brings a, feel, a totally, different, um, totally different level of relating to the Dhamma. The relationship to the Dhamma is a totally different level than one does the jhanas. And the whole life is different. So please, please ask them and see what they say. They must know why they're not teaching them. And I would say it comes from Mahasi Sayadaw because that's where these te- people were trained, I believe. But I, I have no idea. I'm guessing. These are all guesses what I'm expressing. I would guess because in the uh, Jack Cornfield book, the Living with His Masters, we talked about most of the Thai teachers. Most of them talk about um, almost every one in that book talks about the dangers of concentration and absorption states because of attachment to those mm-hmm. states. Well, to that statement, I always say, well, it's better to be attached to that than to all the other things people are attached out there. (laughs) Sex primarily. And I I say that with uh, deliberately. You know, I mean, so get attached to the jhanas if that's what you must do. But if you're taught properly, Everyone who is taught properly knows that this is nothing but the means. You know, that is uh, the means to an end. And the end is inside. But you will see from every step on the way that each one of the jhanas brings particular insight with it. And the higher jhanas bring um, quite um, profound insight and they are called the Vipassana jhanas. That's the higher, higher four, the inside jhanas. And you can't go past them. You can't go past it. It's impossible. So, if that's what's written in that book, that's probably the, uh, the thought behind it. I mean, I've read the book, but it's a long time ago, so I can't exactly remember what's written in that. I... I Find out, ask them. <laughs> it's interesting. I often get the, this question, of course, and I, I, I'm always guessing, because I don't know. Anything else? Yeah. I'm just curious, is this um, also in other traditions, like in Zen Buddhism and Tibetan Buddhism, is there something called, do they introduce the jhanas into the practice? Well, um, I'm not such an expert on those two um, traditions, but I have taught in a a Tibetan-style monastery in Canada, Chogyam Trungpa's monastery. And while there, I went through their library to see, you know, what's what. And uh, they have the book called Mahamudra, written by the seventh Dalai Lama in the 12th century, which contains the jhanas. But they don't use it. Whether there are other traditions, they have five different traditions, huh? the Tibetan thing. Now that one wasn't using it, that particular tradition. Now if there are other traditions that are using it, I can't say again. I don't know. And with then I can tell you this story. I was at the uh, Screen Gulch Wednesday night and the head of practice uh, questioned me right, left and center about the jhanas and he would love to learn them from me. 
and he is uh, the first Zen teacher that I've come across, and I don't know that many, uh, who wants, who is using the Theravadan suttas. He says because they don't have anything to go by, so he's starting to use the suttas. And uh, interestingly enough, he's using this one. <laughs> so um, they need the base, right? So um, he was hoping, I told him that I would start explaining the jhanas as of today, as of this evening, and he was hoping to be able to come, but it is a long drive. It takes a long time to get there. It took us an hour and a half. So it's three hours driving. And um, so I said, maybe, I, you know, we gave him the book and then said, well, maybe he can come next year. So that's all I know as far as that goes. So he, I would say, is a minority of one. I don't know that this is common in the Zen scene, but he, that is his way of, that was my connection with him. So I don't know what other Zen teachers do. Okay, what else? Yeah. I don't know what the giants have to do with what is the right How do they relate? Okay. Jhana means an elevated consciousness. It's a consciousness which is different from the consciousness you have when you go shopping. Okay? It's very difficult to get enlightened while you're going shopping. Right? It's, it's also difficult to get enlightened when you have the jhanas, but at least you've got the right tool. You've got a different consciousness. And when you have this different consciousness, when you then see impermanence, it's no longer a word, nor is it uh, a fact, but it's an experience. And as it becomes an experience, you also see in the higher jhanas that there's nobody there. And when you see there's nobody there, eventually you learn to give yourself up. And as you learn yourself, give, your, give yourself up, you have a chance. But we're going to get to that next week sometime, the steps of insight which lead to liberation and which are all depending on the concentrated mind which can see things totally differently from the way we usually see things. Usually we say things, how much of, of each one I can get for myself, how long I can keep it, how nobody should take it away from me, and how I can get myself in order so that everything is fine around me. Well, nobody's ever been able to do it, and it doesn't work. And that's where all the tragedies come from. One can do a... Um, well, a medium type, everything all right. So when one has a different kind of consciousness, that part of wanting is no longer important. So it changes one's outlook. But uh, the, um, the pathway of those insight steps that will all come together. I'm sure we'll be here long enough to get it all. <laughs> And because we are here for uh, such a good length of time, I also am taking my time and am doing each step very uh, detailed so that there's um, every bit of it included. Anything else? And please put the attention on the breath for just a few moments.
Now imagine that you only consist of a heart full of love. See yourself as only that. No limbs, no thinking, just a heart full of love. And experience that feeling. And now put yourself in the middle of this room, just a heart full of love. And let that heart reach out to everyone here, touching everyone's heart with love. And now put yourself as a heart full of love in the center of this whole place. Reaching out in all directions, touching all beings that you can reach with love. And now make this heart full of love, that is you, much bigger. And put it in the center of Auckland. And let it reach out in all directions, giving love to whoever you can reach. Now make this heart full of love even bigger and position it in the center of California and let the love that is in that heart go out with every pulse beat Feel it beating love and let that reach out as far as it will go.
make the heart even larger as large as you can possibly imagine and put it in the center of the whole of the country and with every heartbeat let the love flow out of it in all directions touching as many people as you can reach Now position this enormously large heart full of love in the center of this globe. And let the love from it flow out in all directions. covering the whole of this globe and its inhabitants. Now think of any special people that you would like to give love to. Let them enter into this huge heart and make their home there. Now think of any people that you believe would benefit greatly from your love. Your heart is so large, they too have room in there. Let them also make their home there.
now find more and more people to enter into your heart, make their home there. Have the happiness of your love. Imagine the largest possible heart that is imaginable. Let as many people be in it as you can. Let them all feel the warmth and embrace of your love. Now put yourself inside that heart too. Just being one of all those people that are already in there, receiving your love. And now feel yourself to be only the heart full of love. May there be love in the hearts of all beings.